What's it like to use a PlayStation Vita in 2023? For some folks, that might seem like a weird question to ask. After all, Sony stopped developing games for the console in 2014, and officially stopped production of cartridges and consoles back in 2019. In 2021, they even tried to shut down the Vita's online store, only to agree to keep it open for the near future after receiving a ton of public backlash. Despite all that being true, plenty of folks, whether out of nostalgia or genuine love for the handheld, are recommending the Vita as a modern gaming device other folks might want to consider. As a Vita owner for almost a decade, I'm excited for the growing wave of enthusiasm for such an underappreciated device, but I also think it's worthwhile not to overstate the Vita's capabilities. Even if there are many reasons a Vita might fit perfectly into someone's handheld arsenal, the market's advanced quite a bit since it first came out in 2011. So in this video, let's go over the actual experience of using the Vita right now. What the Vita does right, what about the Vita is frustrating, and how it stacks up against some of the handheld competition it faces in 2023. Although, as a caveat, before we get started, I'm going to completely ignore the use of smartphones as a dedicated gaming device. Yes, you can make that work, but I'm assuming that someone looking at a PS Vita actually wants a dedicated handheld console that is designed to play games and games alone, complete with an integrated control system, kind of like the Switch Lite, Retroid Pocket, or Steam Deck. Okay, with that out of the way, let's start out with one of the first possible things new folks would notice, and one of the most important things overall, the UI. The Vita's UI is fairly intuitive, animates smoothly, and still manages to be pretty fast all these years later. I've never been a particular fan for the bubble-centric design, but as long as you don't download a few hundred games at once without using folders, it's a relatively convenient organization system that boots fast and makes games easy to find. The overarching card theming for open applications also still feels comfortable and allows for both easily finding extra game info for Vita games and quickly switching between open apps. All of it is quite modern. While I'd say the only UI that comes close to the Vita's streamlined setup would be the Switch, it's common to see front ends for retro handhelds trying to recreate the same feel of being able to turn on the system, quickly find what you need, and get going. In a way, that all lends itself to the Vita actually feeling a bit newer than it is, especially when paired with the sleek design of the slim model. What does not feel modern in any way is the Vita's version of the PlayStation Store, the homepage of which has a variety of options which will selectively either drop you into a curated list or an alphabetical forest that is such a pain to navigate. Given the sheer number of games available through this store, if I don't have a specific game I'm personally looking for, it's a real hassle to find something new. Redownloading games from my library is also the biggest pain they could have made it. There's no dedicated library menu like on the PS4. Instead, it forces me to sift through my complete list of PlayStation downloads to find a game I previously purchased. And yeah, that's right, I said PlayStation downloads because I also have games from my PS3 and PS4 mixed into that list. Heck, some of the games that have a download button near them aren't even compatible with the Vita. Worse yet, when I select something to download, it kicks me out of the list and forces me to scroll down again from the top to find where I left off. Given all the PS Plus games I've redeemed to my library over the past decade, it's a bigger pain than I could possibly stress. And it's worthwhile to highlight the PlayStation Store because that's really the place where newcomers are going to legally acquire most of their games. If you're a longtime PS Plus subscriber who remembered to claim every game available, you probably have a huge library of Vita games already, even if you don't own a Vita. That library includes most of the Vita games most people would probably purchase, like 
Gravity Rush, Uncharted Golden Abyss, Wipeout 2048, Freedom Wars, Fess, and Muramasa Rebirth. For those who haven't given hundreds of dollars to Sony for subscriptions, all those games are still available to purchase through the store, along with a slew of classic PS1 and PSP games. You'll just need to pay full price for them, because there aren't really any sales happening anymore for the larger titles. Sony's also removed the ability to even add funds to your account through the Vita. So you'll either need to cross your fingers that adding funds via their website actually works, or use one of their home consoles to add funds to your account. Luckily, cross-buy still works, which means you could buy certain games for PS4 or PS3 through their respective stores and also get the Vita version automatically thrown in as a bonus. For example, I recently purchased Bastion for PS4 while it was on sale and was able to immediately also download it for my Vita. Like many games, it also supports cross-saves, which makes it really easy for me to play on a Vita while I'm traveling and then later pick up where I left off on my PS5. It's a very modern and convenient feature, and the exact sort of way my wife Emily uses her Switch Lite and a dock Switch OLED to play Splatoon 3. Unfortunately, buying digital might be your only option for most of the worthwhile games out there. For one, many games just don't have physical cards created for them. Indie and classic games may be digital only to begin with, but Sony's drop of support halfway through the Vita's lifespan also meant fewer physical releases to go along with their remaining game launches while the Vita was still active. Luckily, the physical games that do exist are mostly at decent prices right now online. $20 to $50 on average is what I tend to see for the most common games. Games also aren't region locked. If, for instance, you're fine buying a game in Japanese, you can still use your North American console to play that game. However, I found Vita games fairly difficult to track down in game shops at the moment. It's only been a few months since our local shop even started carrying a handful of Vita games, and they've been equally scarce among the dozen or so shops I've been to in the past six months. So you might need to hunt a bit if you feel like tracking down games the old-fashioned way. And I know, I, I know, some of you are probably thinking it's not worth it. You might already be in the comments saying, why not just pirate the games? Well, it's kind of a sticky area. If Sony had already shut down the store, I might be right there with you. But they publicly kept the store open longer than they wanted because people screamed at them that they still wanted it to exist. As a result, all these games are technically easily available right now for you to legally acquire. Just because you personally feel that the value of certain games should decrease over time doesn't change the reality that they haven't and you might need to pay full price to get access to them. If you say, screw it all, I'm not giving Sony more of my money, that, that's your choice but it also lessens the impact and number of voices we have for demanding that Sony keep its store open longer. Not to mention the threat of piracy is literally the reason Sony went overboard and created proprietary memory cards for the Vita in the first place, which ultimately is one of the core reasons why the Vita didn't sell well, but go watch our previous video if you want more. In general, if you're getting into gaming on Vita, it might be worthwhile to at least consider if there are any games you'd like to buy outright to support the game's developers, give business to your local game shop, or just build a legitimate collection for yourself. Along those same lines, I'm gonna take the slightly controversial stance to recommend shelling out extra for the proprietary memory cards instead of jumping straight to an SD2 Vita mod like many folks seem to default to these days. My main rationale is that I found the SD2 Vita mod to mess with my cartridge slot a bit. After modding, I now have to make sure to edit my storage settings and also reboot my console between swapping game cards. As someone who really enjoys physical media, it's pretty annoying. If you're like me and interested in the Vita for mainly Vita games, official memory cards are the way to go. Personally, I found my 16GB card 
that I purchased back in 2013 to be more than enough storage space for my games that I'm interested in playing at the moment. Splurging a bit for a 32 or 64 gigabyte card would probably cover even more, plus a library of ROMs without any issue. Okay, moving on to actual gameplay. Does it hold up? The short answer is yes. The long answer is it might depend on what you actually want to do. Vita games in particular have held up exceedingly well. Quality varies by game, of course, but it's not too hard to find really great looking games that would feel right at home if they came out on Steam or Nintendo Switch today. That's backed by a pair of impressive displays. The colors and contrast of the original OLED continues to be top tier and only really competes with my Switch OLED for sheer vibrance and clarity. Meanwhile, the LCD on the slim model doesn't look as great side by side, but is still a pretty solid display by today's standards that gets much brighter than you might expect, as long as you don't put it under direct sunlight, that is. On sheer quality alone, I'd always recommend the OLED display, but Sony really didn't skimp on either model. If you went with the slim based on aesthetics alone, or the fact that it has internal storage and doesn't charge with a proprietary connector, you're still going to have a great time. On the control side of things, the Vita's action buttons and D-pad still feel excellent to use. It's probably my favorite D-pad outside the Xbox Series controller due to how smooth it feels to use and how well I can roll my thumb in any direction and still get a snappy, clean input. While such small action buttons aren't my favorite, they are very tactile and don't require my thumb to move a ton to hit all of the buttons. If you plan to use a Vita just for puzzle games, RPGs, or visual novels, it's gonna feel great. Like, there's a reason a lot of RPG lovers buy these devices outside of just library selection. Unfortunately, things break down a bit when we get to thumbsticks and shoulder buttons. While I can appreciate how the low profile thumbsticks allow the Vita to fit comfortably into a pocket or bag without becoming too stressed, their short travel and slippery caps feel awkward for any precise aiming or movement. When using them for extended periods of time, I always wind up feeling my thumb sliding off them as I'm holding one of the sticks in a single direction. If given a choice between them and the half-height Joy-Con thumbsticks common in many pocket handhelds today, I'd go with the Joy-Con sticks. The shoulder buttons likewise aren't too great. They feel awkward to press anywhere but the exact center and have never been quite as satisfying as even the smaller shoulder buttons on my 3DS or PSP. The slim model addresses this issue somewhat by slightly recessing the shoulders into the console body to define the ideal pressing range a little bit better but it's still not that great, even by 2011 standards. I could totally feel both of those being up to personal preference though, to be honest. Truth be told, even with those gripes, everything is serviceable here and high quality. Maybe adding a grippier stick cap might even help a bit for anyone who, like me, feels their thumbs sliding too much. Overall, playing Vita games on the Vita still feels great and is an experience that hasn't aged quite as much as some of the other console gameplay from the same time period. Similarly, emulating other consoles is also fantastic. Well, some other consoles at least. Anyone getting a Vita these days, for more than playing Vita games, should really consider modding their system. From having modded both my Vita Slim and a PlayStation TV in the past couple months, I can tell you from experience that it takes about 10 minutes of your time and only requires that you have a working Vita that can connect to the internet. That tiny bit of effort will give you access to Adrenaline, which is possibly my favorite PSP emulation tool on any device. Adrenaline is an app that makes use of the official PSP emulator packed onto the Vita to run PSP firmware. Quite literally, it's like adding a PSP to your PS Vita and it works great. Playing PSP games through this method feels a lot like playing on an actual PSP, just with a much nicer display and a ton of quality of life features. 
For example, in a game like Ratchet and Clank Size Matters, I can copy the camera controls from L and R to place them on the right thumbstick. It's still not as great as having a free roaming camera, but I enjoy having the option nonetheless, and it makes gameplay a bit more enjoyable. Honestly, if you're looking for a machine to play PSP games, it's hard to do better than the PlayStation Vita right now, unless you're dedicated to original hardware or want a much bigger screen. Any PSP games you buy and download from the store even show up in Adrenaline without any additional fuss. Same goes for PS1 games. While not as pristine, PS1 emulation is very solid. Again, this is something Sony worked on themselves, and it's a top quality experience that works really well. Unless, of course, you need trigger buttons. The important thing to note here is that the Vita is one of the few avenues left to legitimately get PS1 and PSP games that aren't tied to a streaming service. And Sony did a lot right getting the games to run well on this hardware. Even if you don't have a ton of favorites among the Vita's own library, using Adrenaline to play PSP and PS1 games might make getting a Vita a worthwhile purchase in itself for fans of either system. One thing you probably shouldn't buy a Vita for is emulating any other system. Other non-Sony handhelds up to Game Boy Advance run well enough, but home consoles hit a hard stopping point at N64, which isn't particularly great on the Vita in the first place. So sure, you can play Pokemon Leaf Green without too many issues, but GameCube, Dreamcast, or PS2 emulation is pretty much out of the question unless someone rewrites a game specifically to work with the Vita, which Sony actually did for a variety of PS2 games. Additionally, even home consoles that technically work aren't going to be flawless in execution. N64 emulation stutters quite a bit and likely won't live up to most other retro handhelds these days. Similarly, SNES emulation is passable, but not pristine. It's one of those cases where a casual session of Super Mario World will likely be fine for most people, but someone who's really into SNES games might have some issues with it. Though, come on, to be honest, those folks should probably be looking at something like the Analog Pocket instead anyway. I think the best I could probably say about emulating non-Sony systems on the Vita is that it's neat, that it can do it at all. Obviously, the Vita emulation community is a magnitude smaller than the Android, Linux, or Windows emulation communities. So, the fact that these emulators are in such good shape is promising, but maybe shouldn't be the sole focus of a Vita purchase decision, or argument for someone's use case of the Vita. Instead, consider it more like a nifty bonus for tinkering a little bit. Where things start to get more awkward is with remote play for PS4 games. Now, don't get me wrong. The actual remote play feature works perfectly and genuinely feels more reliable than remote play on other platforms, which tend to require pairing a DualShock 4 to a computer. If you want to play slower games like Persona 5, you're gonna have a great time. It's only when you start treading into faster paced games with heavy reliance on trigger buttons where things break down a bit. Now, as y'all can see, the Vita doesn't actually have any trigger buttons. Those wouldn't actually really start showing up in a majority of handhelds until a few years after the Vita was released. Sony's workaround was to map both L2 and R2 to the rear touch panel. It's actually a smart idea, but isn't always the most comfortable. It's especially bad on the original Vita model, since I'll often accidentally touch the rear touchpad when resting my hands naturally. The slim model fixed the issue somewhat by shrinking the touchpad in favor of larger hand grips, but it's still a long way from the precision of an actual button. For Vita games in need of triggers, like Borderlands 2, it's an awkward solution, but potentially serviceable if you're that dedicated to making it work. Stepping up to larger, more trigger-dependent PS4 games, like, I don't know, Fallout 76, feels terrible since there's no real feedback that a trigger press has actually been registered. In the heat of a firefight, it feels like I'm flailing around trying to find the right spot to even register the button correctly. 
If you're buying a Vita these days for remote play or any game that requires a ton of trigger usage, you'll definitely want to get a case with integrated trigger buttons. I've got one from Hori for my slim model, which has little touchpads connected to a couple buttons to relay input. It's a bit janky for sure, but makes a game like Spider-Man really comfortable to play for longer periods of time. Just know you still don't have any method for analog input. So games which benefit from analog triggers are going to be more awkward to play or even unplayable, depending on your standards. So far, we've discussed system usage, game availability, playing Vita games, adrenaline, and remote play. Everything's been fairly positive with just a few caveats like poor store design, game prices, tiny thumbsticks, and non-existent trigger buttons. But if you can deal with all that, you get a great looking handheld with solid face buttons, a wonderful display, large library of native games, and impressive backwards and cross device compatibility. There's just one last question to answer. How does that stack up against the modern competition? To get a sense for that, it's worthwhile to identify what the Vita's actually competing against. Sure, you could choose a Vita over a Steam Deck or Switch Lite, but realistically, they're all very different machines. The Vita plays Vita games better than any other setup, while the Steam Deck and Switch Lite are aimed more at modern games, with the Switch specifically limited to Nintendo-sanctioned games unless you mod the system. Plus, while a used Switch Lite is about the same price as a used Vita plus memory card combo, around $150 via eBay, a Steam Deck starts at significantly more. So, yeah. Neither are a great comparison for either price or gameplay, though the Switch gets just a tiny bit closer than the Steam Deck overall. And making any comparison based on ability to play Vita or modern games is basically a non-starter since the Vita will always win at the former and lose at the latter. Ultimately, that means we can only really make comparisons with other systems on the basis of emulation ability alone. And in that retro handheld space, the Vita may actually be quite a hard sell. At a sub $200 price point, we're talking handhelds like the Ein Odin Lite or Retro Pocket Flip. Both of these cost around the same price as a Vita in good condition and can handle all the same systems the Vita can, but with better performance most of the time. Outside of Vita emulation, which it's still a bit spotty via Vita 3K. Both of the other handhelds can even handle systems the Vita can't, like GameCube, Dreamcast, and PS2, with support for cloud streaming and a slightly worse version of Remote Play, though at least they can handle PS5 Remote Play via the official app. That's not to mention how much more flexible Android is as an operating system for emulation just in general. Yes, modding a Vita is super easy, but transferring ROMs and applications to the Vita from another device is very time consuming. Plus, while the Vita's premium design still holds up against anything in this price range, especially in terms of display and face buttons, the integrated triggers and larger screens of the modern competition are likely to be killer features for a lot of people. In many ways, the Vita just doesn't hold up. So, why choose it over the other options available? Well, there are a few reasons, not including the ability to play Vita games without worry. The first and main sticking point for me is that I can still legally increase my PSP and PS1 library through the Vita and play those games back exceptionally well on the Vita itself. If you're really into PSP games, performance is only a step shy of the OG PSP and the hardware is overall a huge step above. My Slim is basically my dedicated PSP device at this point, and I love it. The second reason is the form factor. While bigger screens and trigger buttons may be crucial for some systems, it's not all that necessary for the types of consoles the Vita can actually handle. Plus, the compact form factor and low height of the sticks are great for throwing in a bag without worry and might just be right for anyone with smaller hands. Third and finally, it's just neat to tinker with the Vita. 
while playing Vita, PSP, and PS1 and remote play games are incredibly easy and have very little or no setup, there's a lot of fun to be had messing with different utilities, backing up games for preservation and emulation, or getting different emulators up and running. Most modern handhelds are pretty streamlined with their setup, with installing emulators being really simple, which, you know, I honestly appreciate and you probably might too. But for those who like to work a little bit harder or try to tinker with hardware to use it in a way contrary to the developer's intentions, the Vita is going to scratch that itch much better than anything else. Except maybe a 3DS, but that's an entirely different conversation. Ultimately, I think intention is key here. There are a ton of great options to consider within the Vita's price range. If you want the most performant option, or even a general purpose emulation device that can do everything, the Vita doesn't quite fit. But if you're looking for a great Vita or PSP player that can do some additional things, fit easily into a backpack, and create a lot of opportunities to tinker, I think you'll love the Vita. At minimum, it should at least be comforting to know that the Vita's design holds up over a decade later, and games are still very easy to obtain for the system. As long as you know what you're getting yourself into, then yeah, the Vita is a fantastic handheld, well worth considering for any newcomer or veteran alike. Those are my thoughts though. I'd love to know yours. Are you interested in buying a Vita in the future and trying to figure out if it's the right choice for you? Are you a Vita owner already with thoughts of your own on who you'd actually recommend picking up a Vita themselves? Let me know down in the comments. And as always, if you found this video helpful or informative, go ahead and give it a like. Then be sure to get subscribed for more Vita related content in the future. On top of covering the coolness that is the Vita 3K emulator, there's also the PlayStation TV on deck for future videos. To make sure you don't miss out, check out the Twitter and Kofi links in the description for updates on new videos and the Patreon link for even earlier access to those videos. That's going to be all for this video though. Until next time, catch you later.